You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today I'm going to ask a very, very important question. It is a question you are likely to never be asked again, so I don't know how important it truly is. The question is, do chickens fly? Yeah, that's a legit question for the purposes of our conversation today. So, do chickens fly? I'm going to start this off with um, not very well. They do not fly very well. I was in Ohio recently over the holidays, and uh, my my wife's sister has a chicken coop in their suburb uh, of of Cincinnati, and let the chickens out of the coop. And my little uh, nephew, who's the same age as my son, four years old, would run around and catch these chickens. And he was the best of all of us, probably because he's closer to the ground to be able to do so. And right around when you'd start to grab a chicken, I, when I would grab a chicken, I'd start to reach for it, it would take off flying a little bit, wouldn't go far, uh, it would kind of just go into blast off mode, and then it would land, and it would walk again, and then you get close to it, and it would blast off, and it would fly for a moment, and then land and walk again. So, the, the answer to the question is yes, but hold on to that, because I'm coming back to it. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. But for today and the purposes of our conversation today and where this is going to come in more handy in a moment is we're going to be talking about skeletal muscle fibers. And I will say that there are big differences between the uh, muscle fibers of a chicken and those of a human. But I think the correlations you will find when we get to the end of this podcast is quite interesting. And if nothing else, will help you better understand the different types of muscle fibers. And we're going to start with the two main muscle fibers. There's type 1 and type 2. And type 2 has a subcategory of fibers. There's type 2A and there's type 2X. Now, well, let's just talk about type 1 and type 2X because those are the extremes. Those are the ones with the biggest amount of differences to them. And then the type 2A is kind of in between both of them. So type 1 and type 2X. Now, you may be asking the question, if you've studied this in the past and it's not been that recent, you may have may be asking the question, well, I've heard of type 2B muscle fibers, but not type 2X. And the taxonomy has shifted a little bit, so the names have shifted, names have changed. And from the categorization of these and how they were initially categorized looking at muscle fibers of small mammals like rats, um, they found that when they were initially categorized, then the similarities in the muscle fibers that humans have more resemble the type 2X, not B. So they're, they've just been recategorized. Now, I've seen some people say there's type 2B and type 2X, and that doesn't seem to really be be in the research. It doesn't seem to be in the data. What seems to have happened is that they just changed the name and they changed the categorization. So if you see something that says type 2B and type 2X, it is likely not the case or at least not that I've seen according to any of the research. Now, let's get into the talk of the talk. Type 1 muscle fibers. Uh, sometimes these are referred to as slow oxidative fibers. They've also been known as slow twitch muscle fibers. And sometimes people have said they are the red muscle fibers. And that makes sense too. And we'll find out more why that makes sense later. But let's discuss this. So it's slow in oxidation, which is, it, it's interesting because Type 1 muscle fibers are highly aerobic. And when it comes to aerobic, we need this process of oxygen being used to help create the utilization of the, the substrates in order to produce force or produce ATP. And ATP is the currency for which the body uses to, to create energy. And we're going to talk about bioenergetics possibly the next time that, uh, that I do this. So we'll talk about ATP. We'll talk about bioenergetics and metabolism a little bit in a later episode. Let's just stay on the muscle fiber types. So uh, they're slow oxidative. And they're also slow twitch. Now, 
sometimes people are curious as to what that means. And twitch just means once the muscle fiber is innervated, it's the speed at which that muscle fiber contracts. So it has a slower twitch or a slower contraction speed than do some of the other muscle fibers. And then they're red muscle fibers. Well, if we talk about this being highly aerobic and it has a high mitochondrial volume, then what, the reason that they're red is because if something's highly aerobic, it means that something's got to be delivering oxygen to these muscles in order for it to be aerobic, because aerobic means with oxygen. So that means there's going to be a large blood supply providing oxygen to these. So they're going to have a lot of capillaries around these muscles. They're also going to have large concentrations of what's called myoglobin, which contains heme. And heme is really what allows the red of the fiber to appear, which it does. That's with the, how iron connects onto it. And then this large capacity of aerobic um, capability allows it to also be fatigue resistant. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't fatigue. Certainly, you will at some point. But when you do a slow pace, moderate intensity exercise, you should be able to do that for a relatively prolonged period of time, at least for your muscles. So if your heart rate's not too incredibly high, if your respiratory rate's not that high, which means you're probably aerobic if your respiratory rate's relatively low. So if your respiratory rate's not that high, if with all things being the same, so your ankles don't hurt, your knees don't hurt, your back doesn't hurt, your tendons and ligaments, everything's in working order, the muscles can maintain utilization of that for a prolonged period of times. And they get better at it, which means if you're going on longer exercises, then as long as you're minimizing the impact and building yourself up as you would in any exercise program, you can continue to do that for prolonged periods of time. So I think this is a really great concept because as you practice this, you start to at least begin to develop more mitochondrial density. And that becomes really valuable because then you become even more fatigue resistant. Then you become even uh, less fatigued as you continue on. So we got this slower maximum shortening velocity or how fast they twitch. We have lower myosin ATP ACE, which we'll discuss in a moment regarding to type 2 muscle fibers and why that's important. Um, and there's an interesting, because some research suggests that there's a approximately 68% in it of uh, the type 1 muscle fibers in women and 55% in men, while other research shows there are no differences between type 1 and type 2 muscle fiber distribution between male and female. So what is the answer? I don't know. Why does it matter? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. You still train the way that you train. So even if you do have more oxidative muscle fibers, these type 1 muscle fibers, slow twitch, red muscle fibers, it may mean that you could be better at some of the longer endurance athletics uh, because of the type of muscle fibers that exist. And some people will talk about um, the... Uh, like like old Russia, when it came to the Olympics, then they would they would do biopsies to see which of the the youth athletes had more type of one fiber versus the other, and then they would shunt them towards whatever they had the more fiber type of. So if they had more type one muscle fiber, then they would be geared more towards endurance based athletic pursuits. Well, let's talk about type two. X muscle fiber. So it's going to be on the other extreme and give us a little more information on what that is and what it does. So for, uh, it used to be called type 2B muscle fiber. So the taxonomy has changed. So we change how we speak with that. Fast twitch. Again, twitch is the speed of the contraction once that is innervated. So it contracts really quickly. And what this is good for is really quick movement, very explosive movement. They also tend to hypertrophy more. They have more hypertrophy. And so if I've got greater hypertrophy, which is increased size of skeletal muscle, then that may uh, be some of the differences that you see when you look at a sprinter uh, 
and how large the muscles are in sprinters versus seeing an endurance based athlete and how lean and I guess they're both lean, but how relatively thin they are when it comes to skeletal muscles versus the sprinter. But they're quick to fatigue. So if you watch a 100 meter sprint, right? So people run 100 meters. At the end of that, that's about all they got. 100 meters. And it can't keep going. So it's only going to last, uh, doesn't last very long, the, the ability of those muscle fibers to produce force. And we will get more into this when we talk about bio, bioenergetics and we talk about aerobic and anaerobic capacities and what anaerobic and aerobic means. And then glycolysis in a, uh, in a different conversation. But for right now, know that these are these type 2X muscle fibers are anaerobic. They are able to produce and create ATP without the presence of oxygen. And it's highly inefficient the way that it's done, but it's really explosive. It just can't last very long. And so they're, they're less efficient than all the other types of muscle fibers. They're really quick to fatigue. But they also tend to hypertrophy quite well. So that's it's pretty interesting, those differences be, between the two. And it has large amounts of that ATP ACE that we discussed. Now, let's talk about what the in-between fibers look like, the type 2A muscle fibers, those in-between. So it's a different subtype of the type 2 fibers. So if I've got a different subtype of the type 2 muscle fibers... Um, sorry, my, my camera stopped for just a moment. I'm going to back to re-recording here. Type 2A muscle fibers, different subtype of type 2. They're moderate number of mitochondria. They're moderate resi uh, resistance to fatigue. There's a combination of aerobic and anaerobic um, activity that's taking place. There's high twitch speed, but it's somewhere in between type 1 and type 2. It's got a moderate efficiency, and although resistance training increases the size of both type 1 and type 2 fibers, weight training elicits a greater degree of hypertrophy in type 2 fibers. But what does it matter? If you've got more type 1 fibers and you're getting more type 1 fibers to hypertrophy, then that's great if that's what your goals are. And so, um, and also know that generally speaking, hypertrophy is not necessarily correlated to um, athletic performance, depending on what you're trying to do. Like if you need to just have more size, then hypertrophy can be quite helpful. But the distribution of type 1 and type 2 fibers uh, shouldn't matter much. There's something interesting, though, that regular exercise can modify... The, and this is from Scott Powers in, uh, in his exercise physiology textbook. Regular exercise training can modify both the biochemical and contractile properties of the human muscle fibers and can result in the conversion of fast fibers into slow fibers. But we don't actually see the reverse of that. So we don't actually see slow fibers being converted into, or type 1 fibers being converted into type 2 fibers. Now, I don't know if this is a true conversion, and this is just my lack of knowledge on this, I don't know if this is a true conversion of type 2 fibers into type 1 fiber, or a conversion into the behavior of a type 2A fiber into a type 1 fiber. Because sometimes they've They've referred to this as a type 2A fiber, as a pendulum muscle that tends to behave in certain ways depending on how you train it. So it can take on some of the properties of a type 1 muscle fiber, take on some of the properties of a type 2X muscle fiber. Now, we have also know that high-intensity exercise results in accelerated production of lactate and hydrogen ions. And what that means is you start to get that burning sensation if you've ever done... I, let's just throw something out there, like leg extensions, right? So you start to do leg extensions, and you get to that 8, 10 repetition range, and it burns. That is burning the quads. And then you put the weight down and quickly slide your legs out and you just kind of wiggle them around and kick your legs back and forth trying to get that burn to go away, right? That is an increase in hydrogen ions. Sometimes we say that it's lactic acid, which maybe, and lactate is just the ability of that 
to, to take on some hydrogen ions and for it to, to bind to, which we eventually will um, utilize back into the Krebs cycle. And so anybody that's sore like a day later, that that's not lactic acid or lactate buildup in your muscles. That's damage to the muscle tissue. Uh, and that's where DOMS comes from. But DOMS isn't because of an increase in lactate in the muscle uh, or a uh, increase in hydrogen ions, which is known as acidosis, but it is because you've created some sort of damage into the muscle and your body's going through this process of uh, catabolic process, which is there, it's breaking down. And then with that protein intake and that resynthesis goes into an anabolic process. So you're building those muscles back up. Now, high intensity interval training increases the buffering capacity to make it easier to transport those hydrogen ions, which is what makes that burning feeling, uh, out, of, out of the system. So it, it actually increases your buffering capacity, which means for those of you who are doing high-intensity classes and you feel the burn, you feel the burn, you feel the burn, that's great. But if you keep doing that, you're going to get better at it, and you'll notice that you don't feel the burn so much. Or if you do those leg extensions regularly, even though you're still kind of hitting capacity at your 8 to 10 repetition mark, and you start um, feeling the burn, but that burn isn't quite as bad as it used to be. It's because you've increased this buffering capacity for that to happen. Now, real quick, let's talk about hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. Hypertrophy is the increase in size of skeletal muscle. So I've got this increased size of skeletal muscle with hypertrophy, and then there's hyperplasia, which is the increase in the total number of fibers within the muscle. So it's not increase in size, but it is increase of number of fibers within a muscle. Well, that one's pretty controversial, the hy hyperplasia. We know hypertrophy takes place, which is increase in size. Um, there's some research that says, yes, there you can increase the number of muscle fibers, hyperplasia. And there's some that says that you absolutely cannot. So one of the things that, whether we know what the answer is or not, one thing we do know is that even if hy hyperplasia is real, it's not as substantial as hypertrophy, and it should not be a limiting component of what we report to people. Here's something else interesting, I thought. There's a 20-week resistance training program, and it said that it decreased the percentage of type 2X fibers from 5 to 11%, with a corresponding rise in type 2A fibers in the trained muscle. So what that shows is that resistance training created a shift from the type 2X into type 2A muscle fibers. Now, why is that important? Well, it's because resistance training, which we like to think it's going to be primarily type 2X fiber dominant, is not really. Type 2X is fast twitch. So that's about explosiveness. So unless you are lifting super heavy or moving incredibly fast. So unless you're going super heavy or going in fast, then you're not necessarily uh, going to affect those type 2 muscle fibers, really, or uh, those type 2X muscle fibers. Uh, so resistance training can start to shift that, and we're talking about typical kind of hypertrophy training. And then there's one more thing that we're going to address is Henneman's size principle. Now, think about this all-or-nothing principle. All-or-nothing means that we're going to, basically, if I, I pull an arrow back, and I let go of the string of that bow very slowly, it doesn't mean that the arrow shoots less quickly. The arrow still shoots just as fast if I let go quick as if I let go slowly. Well, the same thing when a muscle fiber gets innervated, the muscle fiber is going to um, twitch, and it twitches everything that it innervates at 100%. So what may happen, according to the size principle, is that when things aren't that heavy and we go to pick them up, the size principle says, oh, I'm not going to recruit large numbers of motor units or larger size muscle fibers necessarily. I'm going to recruit small motor units for lifting smaller objects. And when more force is required, more motor, motor units are going to be recruited. But when you get a graded exercise test, maybe like a Bruce protocol on a treadmill, 
where you start off slowly and then you get faster and the grade of the, the treadmill increases in its incline, then you start requiring other muscle fiber types that jump in there. Now, there is a caveat. Explosive movements will engage fast twitch fibers immediately to allow for faster movements. Now think about this. Olympic lifters or baseball pitchers or 100 meter sprinters or anybody that's doing anything wildly dynamic, incredibly fast, the body doesn't necessarily say, let me start slow and then recruit fast. There's an explosiveness. There's an explosiveness that immediately happens in those tw uh, type two twitch fibers move at their absolute fastest speed. And they jump in there. So here's my question, and why I ask it. Can chickens fly? The answer is yes. But why do I ask that, and how does that have anything to do with muscle fibers? Well, I think a lot of us may understand that if you look at the difference between a chicken leg and a chicken breast, gives you a pretty good indication of what the differences are in type 1 muscle fibers and type 2. Type 1 muscle fibers would be the endurance fibers, the legs. Chickens can walk around on their legs all day long, but do those legs hypertrophy very well? No, at least not compared to the breast of the chicken. So they are red. They have high endurance. There's capillary density, which allows those muscles to be red. They are smaller, have less hypertrophy. And the chicken breast, on the other hand, it's white. So it doesn't have the, the, the capillary density, the aerobic capacity. It's anaerobic. It's short flight, but man, that flight is explosive. And those muscles hypertrophy in the breast of the chicken because of that. So can chickens fly? Yes. Not very well. Why? Because they fatigue very quickly. Anyway, I hope that the, the chickens help to give you an idea. And again, there's a big difference between muscle fibers in humans and in chickens and the distribution. Uh, we don't have any part of our body that's like, hey, that, that muscle is uh, a, a white muscle fiber uh, or a fast twitch fiber. And this one isn't. They're all intermixed and intermingled mingled throughout the human body. But the chicken is a good example to give you an idea of how to remember them and what they look like. So anyway, I hope you found this very helpful. And, uh, and again, as always, reach out, rick.richie at nasm.org. Or you can hit me up on Instagram, dr.rickrichie. And let me know if you have any questions, anything I can answer for you. Continue to listen to the podcast. Continue to share the podcast with others. It's really helpful. The podcast is growing, and I appreciate it. NASM appreciates it. Thank you for everything that you do, and keep listening.